This is the lecture on electrons and how they are arranged around the nucleus. Aeronautical engineers use wind tunnels and scale models to simulate and test the forces from the moving air on each proposed design. The scale model shown is a physical model. However, not all models are physical. In fact, several theoretical models of the atom have been developed over the past few hundred years. In this section, you will learn about the currently accepted model of how electrons behave in atoms in the following slide. Here is a car and they're testing the airflow and the dynamics, the fluid dynamics relative to uh, the car and how it moves through uh, air streams. The development of atomic models. So far in this textbook, the model for the atom consisted of protons and neutrons making up a nucleus surrounded by electrons. After discovering the atomic nucleus, Rutherford used existing ideas about the atom and proposed an atomic model in which the electrons move around the nucleus, like the planets move around the sun. Rutherford's model explained only a few simple properties of the atom or atoms. It could not be explained, for example, why metals or compounds of metals give off characteristic colors when heated in a flame or why objects when heated to higher and higher temperatures first glow dull red, then yellow, then white, as shown in figure one in the following slide. Rutherford's atomic model could not explain the chemical properties of elements, explaining what leads to chemical properties of elements requires a model that better describes the behavior of electrons within atoms. Here is a, a figure. Rutherford's model fails to explain why objects change color when heated. As the temperature of a horseshoe is increased, it first appears black, then red, then yellow, and then white. The observed behavior could be explained only if atoms in the iron gave off light in specific amounts of energy. A better atomic model was needed to explain this observation. The development of atomic models. Niels Bohr, 1885 to 1962, a young Danish physicist and a student of Rutherford, believed Rutherford's model needed improvement. In 1913, Bohr changed Rutherford's model to include newer discoveries about how energy of an atom changes when it absorbs or emits light. He considered the simplest atom hydrogen, which has one electron. Bohr proposed that an electron is found only in specific circular paths or orbits around the nucleus. The timeline, figure two, in the following slide, shows the development of atomic models from 1800 to 1935. These illustrations show how the atomic model has changed as scientists learned more about the atom structure. Uh, the next page. These next two slides illustrate the timeline for the development of atomic structure. We start with 1803 and John Dalton pictures atoms as tiny indestructible particles with no internal structure. That's the Dalton model. The Thomson model in 1897, see how it's almost a hundred years later, J.J. Thomson, a British scientist, discovers the electron, the later, the latter leads to his plum pudding model. Never had plum pudding. He pictures electrons embedded in a sphere of positive electrical charge. So the sphere, the atom is electrically charged. It's a, a, a positive charge. It's interesting. In 1904, just seven years later, uh, Hantaro Nagaoka, a Japanese physicist, suggests that an atom has a central nucleus. The electrons move in orbits like the rings of Saturn. And then in 1911, just another seven years later, uh, New England physicist Ernest 
Rutherford finds that an atom has a small, dense, positively charged nucleus. Electrons move around the nucleus. So that is going to uh, endorse Hantaro Nagaoka, uh, the Japanese physicist's idea of the internal structure of the atom. Rutherford was from uh, New Zealand, and uh, so we had uh, British, Japanese, and New Zealand scientists up to this point uh, that are recorded as major contributors to the genesis of the structure, the atomic structure. Now in 1913, just a couple years later, Niels Bohr's model, the electron moves in a circular orbit at fixed distances from the nucleus. So you can see that they're not necessarily coming up with their own specific, absolutely positively black and white unique idea. These are all evolving from contributions made before. So you saw a earlier model where they orbit like the rings of Saturn. Nagaoka said that. And then Niels Bohr kind of picks up on that. So now we're at 1923, uh, just about, what, 27 years after J.J. Uh, Thompson. French physicist Louis de Broglie proposes that moving particles like electrons have some properties of waves. Within a few years, experimental evidence supports the idea. So here we have, if you look up top, top left, where the electron, an electron can gain or lose energy by changing its orbit. That is the, that is the cause, that is, the, that is where electromagnetic radiation comes from. It comes from electron transitions. Now we have in 1926, Erwin Schrodinger develops mathematical equations to describe the motion of electrons in atoms. His work leads to the electron cloud model. So this is a picture of the electron cloud. The electrons are moving so fast that it creates a cloud like the like fan blades or propeller blades where you get this kind of shadow that you know something's there and you don't really want to touch it because you might get hurt. Uh, it says up top, top left, the nucleus contains protons and neutrons. So you have this solid core based on Rutherford's uh, idea and uh, other, so other physicists as well. And it says the electron cloud is a visual model of the probable locations of electrons in an atom. The probability of finding an electron is higher in the denser regions of the cloud. Makes sense. Now, in 1932, James Chadwick, an English physicist, confirms the existence of neutrons, which have no charge. Atomic nuclei contain neutrons and positively charged protons. The development of atomic models. Each possible electron orbit in Bohr's model has fixed energy. The fixed energies an electron can have are called energy levels. The fixed energy levels of electrons are, are somewhat like the rungs of a ladder in figure 3a, the following slide. The lowest rung of the ladder corresponds to the lowest energy level. A person can climb up or down the ladder by going from rung to rung. Similarly, an electron can jump from one energy level to another. A person on a ladder cannot stand between the rungs. Similarly, the electron in an atom cannot be between energy levels. So that's a, actually a very good analogy, that the electron can't be between energy levels. It has to choose one or the other. And here's the rings, the rungs of the ladder. These ladder steps are somewhat like energy levels. A, in the ordinary ladder, the rungs are equally spaced. B, the energy levels energy levels in atoms are unequally spaced like the rungs in this ladder. The higher energy levels are closer together. To move from one rung to another, a person climbing a ladder must move just the right distance. To move from one energy level to another, an electron must gain or lose just 
the right amount of energy. It's going to be called a quantum. That's where the quantum comes from. In general, the higher an electron is on the energy ladder, the farther it is from the nucleus. A quantum of energy is the amount of energy required to move an electron from one energy level to another. The energy of an electron is said to be quantized. You've probably heard the term quantum leap used to describe an abrupt change. The term originates from the ideas found in the Bohr model of the atom. Let me read something in that paragraph again. It says, in the middle, it says a quantum of energy is the amount of energy required to move an electron from one energy level to another energy level. That's not quite true. A quantum is the energy that is required to move an electron uh, from one energy level to another away from the nucleus. So it has to gain a quantum of energy to move to those higher levels. However, when the electron moves down from level to level, it will give off a quantum. So the energy has to be put in to move it up the rungs, away from the nucleus. But to go toward the nucleus, each rung, or two rungs or three rungs, it's going to give off a quantum of energy. You see, when you irradiate an atom, you're irradiating with more energy than you could possibly need to get these electrons to jump. So you're irradiating it with energy. But the atom is going to react in a predictable way. The certain electrons are going to gain energy, and then what they're going to do, they're going to try to become stable again and jump back down and give off specific amounts of energy. So a strontium atom, if it's irradiated, will give off, like with a flame, will give off red light because that's the electromagnetic radiation, that's the wavelength that's giving off. So that quantum has a certain wavelength. That quantum is light, it's electromagnetic radiation. That electromagne electromagnetic radiation is in the visible spectrum. It has a certain wavelength that is consistent with red light. The amount of energy an electron gains or loses in an atom is not always the same. Like the rungs of the strange ladder in figure 3b. The energy levels in an atom are not equally spaced. The higher energy levels are closer together. It takes less energy to climb from one rung to another near the top of the ladder in figure 3b, where the rungs are closer together. Similarly, the higher the energy level occupied by an atom, the less energy it takes to move from that energy level to the next higher energy level. The Bohr model gave results in agreement with experiment for the hydrogen atom. However, it still failed in many ways to explain the energies absorbed and emitted by atoms with more than one electron uh, as the plot thickened. The Rutherford planetary model and Bohr model of the atom are based on describing paths of moving electrons as you would describe the path of a large moving object. New theoretical calculations and experimental results were inconsistent with describing electron motion this way. In 1926, the Austrian physicist Erwin Schrod Schrodinger used these new results to devise and solve a mathematical equation describing the behavior of the electron in a hydrogen atom. The modern description of the electron in atoms, the quantum mechanical model, comes from the mathematical solutions to the Schrodinger equation. Like the Bohr model, the quantum mechanical model of the atom restricts the energy of electrons to certain values. Unlike the Bohr model, however, the quantum mechanical model does not involve an exact path the electrons takes around the nucleus. The quantum mechanical model determines the allowed energies in 
uh, I'm sorry, the allowed energies an electron can have, and how likely it is to find the electron in various locations around the nucleus. How likely it is to find an electron in a particular location is described by probability. If you place three red marbles and one green marble into a box and then pick a marble without looking, the probability of picking a green marble is 1 in 4 or 25%. This means that if you put the four marbles in a box and pick one and repeated this a great many times, you would pick a green marble in 25% of your tries. The quantum mechanical model description of how the electron moving around the nucleus is similar to the motion of a rotating propeller blade or a rotating fan blade. Very similar. You get that shadowy uh, existence of something's there. Figure 4 in the following slide shows the propeller blade has the same probability of being anywhere in the blurry region it produces in the picture, but you cannot tell its precise location at any instance. Similarly, in the quantum mechanical model of the atom, the probability of finding an electron within a certain volume of space surrounding the nucleus can be represented by a fuzzy cloud. The cloud is more dense where the probability of finding the electron is high. The cloud is less dense where the probability of finding an electron is low. All right, here we have an airplane, and you can see the propeller blade as it flies over the mountains. And then next to it is a, an atom with the electron cloud. The electron cloud of an atom is compared here to a photograph of a spinning propeller, an airplane propeller. The airplane propeller is somewhere in the blurry region it produces in this picture. But the picture does not tell you its exact position at any instant. Similarly, the electron cloud of an atom represents the location where an atom is likely to be found. Uh, same can be true with a fan blade, anything spinning, where anything you're creating a, a shadow, a, a, a blur. Though it is unclear where the, where the cloud ends, there is at least a slight chance of finding the electron at a considerable distance from the nucleus, relative to the size of the nucleus. Therefore, attempts to show probabilities as a fuzzy cloud are usually limited to the volume in which the electron is found 90% of the time. This visualize, to visualize an electron probability cloud, imagine that you could mold a stack around the cloud so that the electron is inside the stack 90% of the time. The shape of the stack would give you a useful picture of the shape of the cloud. Solving the Schrodinger equation gives the energies an electron can have. These are its energy levels. For each energy level, the Schrodinger equation also leads to a mathematical expression called an atomic orbital. Describing the probability of finding an electron at various locations around the nucleus. An atomic orbital is often thought of as a region of space in which there is a high probability of finding an electron. The energy levels of electron in the quantum mechanical model are labeled by principal quantum numbers, n. I spoke about that when I did the electron configurations. These are assigned values for n, and this is going to become very important later. n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, and so forth, uh, up to 7, 7s2, for instance. For each principal energy level, there may be several orbits, orbitals with different shapes and at different energy levels. These energy levels within a principal energy level constitute energy sublevels, that's SPDF. Each energy sublevel corresponds to an orbital of a different shape. See how we're using orbital? Very, very, uh, it's, it's a, it's a well-defined word. It has many definitions. Uh, let's read that again. Each energy level corresponds to an orbital 
of a different shape, which describes where the electron is likely to be found. Different atomic orbitals are denoted by letters, as shown in figure 5. S orbital, for instance. Let me read that again. S orbitals are spherical, and P orbitals are dumbbell-shaped. D orbitals are even more complex, and F suborbitals are very strange indeed, and we'll look at these later. These are the principal quantum numbers, and there is where you have the, uh, the little orbital. So you have n principal energy levels, then you have the number of sublevels. So for n equals 1, you have s, uh, 2, you have s and p, 3, you have spd, and 4, you have spdf. So the first time you see an s is in 1, the first time you see a p is in 2, the first time you see a d is in 3, and the first time you see an f is in 4. Here you have the orbital and suborbital shapes. You have the px orbital on the x-axis. You have the py orbital on the y-axis. You have the pz orbital on the z-axis. You put them all together. Bottom center, you have a rather complex-looking suborbital p with three uh, dumbbells. And then you have the s orbital, which is just one sphere. Notice, notice the, what we said before. You have the word orbital is, is, has many definitions. So you can, you can put two electrons in each orbital. And the orbitals are part of the suborbital. The suborbital is SPDF. Now you have these little tiny orbitals that the electrons can go in. So the capacity of S is 2, so it has one orbital. The capacity of P is 6, so you have three orbitals. The capacity of D is 10, so you have five orbitals. And the capacity of F is 7, you have seven orbitals. Don't get confused with the different usage of the word orbitals, very important. Because of the spherical shape of an S orbital, the probability of finding an electron at a given distance from the nucleus in an s orbital does not depend on direction. The three kinds of p orbitals have different orientations in space. Figure 6 on the following slide shows the shapes of the d orbitals. Four of the five kinds of d orbitals have cloverleaf shapes. The shapes of the f orbitals are more complicated than the d orbitals. The numbers of kinds of or, or atomic orbitals depends on the energy sublevel. The lowest sublevel, n equals 1, has only one sublevel called 1s. The second principal energy level, n equals 2, has two sublevels, 2s and 2p. The 2p sublevel is of higher energy than the 2s and consists of three p orbitals of equal energy. The long axis of each dumbbell shaped p orbital is perpendicular to the other two. It is convenient to label these orbitals 2px, 2py, and 2pz. Figure 6, the d orbitals are illustrated here. Four of the five d orbitals have the same shape but different orientations in space. And as we become more complex with our studies, we'll find that F, even though we don't see it in this book, is even more complicated. So those are the five orbitals. Look at the shape of the fifth orbital. So those are the shapes of the orbitals. They're kind of like two sets of dumbbells perpendicular to one another. Kind of weird looking. And why that fifth one would be different, very odd. Thus, the second principal energy level has four orbitals, 2s, and then 2px, 2py, 2pz. The third principal energy level, n equals 3, has three sublevels. These are called 3s, 3p, and 3d. As shown in figure 6, the 3d sublevel consists of 5d orbitals of equal energy. Thus, the third principal energy level has nine orbitals. 1, 3s, 3, 3p, and 5, 3d. The fourth 
principal energy level, n equals 4, has four sublevels called 4s, 4p, 4d, and 4f. The 4f sublevel consists of 7f orbitals of equal energy. The fourth principal energy level then has 16 orbitals. Remember, two in each, that's 32. 1, 4s, 3, 4p, 5, 3d, and 7, 4f orbitals. So that you'll find familiar based on our discussion of electron configuration. Next. As, men as mentioned, the principal quantum number always equals the number of sublevels within, the, within that principal energy level. The maximum number of electrons that can occupy a principal energy level is given by the formula 2n squared, where n is the principal quantum number. The number of electrons allowed in each of the first four energy levels is shown in table 2 in the following slide. So if you put 1, 2, 3, 4 in that order in the equation or the expression 2n squared, you'll get 2, 8, 18, and 32. So let's look at, let's look at 18. Uh, you square 3, that's 9, times 2 is 18. Uh, you square 4, that's 16, times 2 is 32. So using that expression, you can predict the maximum number of electrons. Does the scene look natural to you? Surprisingly, it is. Arrangements like this, it's on the next slide, are rare in nature because they are unstable. Unstable arrangements, whether the grains of sand in a sand castle or the rock formation shown here, tend to become more stable by losing energy. If this rock were to tumble over, it would end up at a lower height. It would have less energy than before, but its position would be more stable. In this section, you will learn the energy that energy and stability play an important role in determining how electrons are configured in an atom. If you learn nothing else, remember this, that there are two reasons why chemical reactions occur. The main reason, or the one reason, not necessarily the main reason, is that chemicals, the atoms that make up chemicals, the particles that make up chemicals, want to be stable. They want to lose energy to be more stable. That's one of the driving forces. Obviously, there has to be another driving force because sometimes, sometimes chemicals gain energy, become less stable, and form less stable molecules or compounds. So there's got to be another driving force, but, and we'll talk about that later, but let's introduce the first of two, and there's only two driving forces in nature, and that is that things seek to be more stable. That's the natural way of the universe, the natural order. Yes, there are chemicals that seek to be more stable, or sorry, less stable, but they stay, there's another trade-off, there's another driving force, but we won't talk about that now. Just remember that it is normal, quote-unquote normal. What is normal? For a, for a substance to seek stability. And here's the picture that we, it was referred to. It would certainly lose energy if that fell. Try to balance a pencil on its point. Each time you try, the pencil falls over. At the end of its fall, its energy has decreased. In most, not all, natural phenomena, change proceeds towards the lowest possible energy. Not all, though. In an atom, electrons and the nucleus interact to make the most stable arrangement possible. The ways in which electrons are arranged in various orbitals around the nuclei of atoms are called electron configurations. Three rules, three rules. The off-bow principle, the Pauli exclusion principle, and Hund's rule tell you how to find the electron configuration of atoms. Those are going to be very three very, very important scientists and rules. Off-bow principle, 
According to the Aufbau principle, electrons occupy the orbitals of lowest energy first. Look at the Aufbau diagram in figure 7. It'll be on the next slide. Each box represents an atomic orbital. The orbitals for any sublevel of a principal energy level are always of equal energy. Further, within a principal energy level, the S sublevel is always the lowest energy sublevel. Yet the range of energy levels within a principal energy level can overlap the energy levels of one principal level. Notice again in figure 7 that the filling of atomic orbitals does not follow a simple pattern beyond the second energy level. It gets a little bit crazy and you'll see that as we proceed. You can see that you have 3p then 4s, 3d is, bef is right after 4s and then 4p. So it gets a little bit, a little bit hairy. This Aufbau diagram shows the energy levels of the various atomic orbitals. Orbitals of greater energy are higher on the diagram. For example, the 4s orbital is lower in energy than the 3d orbital. Pauli exclusion principle. According to the Pauli exclusion principle, an atomic orbital may describe at most two electrons. For example, either one or two electrons can occupy an S orbital or a P orbital. To occupy the same orbital, two electrons must have opposite spins. That is, the electron spins must be paired. Spin is a quantum mechanical property of electrons and may be thought of as clockwise or counterclockwise. A vertical arrow indicates an electron and its direction of spin. You can see that it's going to be represented uh, as such. It says an orbital containing paired electrons is written as uh, a circle or a square with two arrows. The first arrow is going to be positive one half and the next is going to be negative one half, but we'll see that later. When you use the Aufbau diagram to decide how electrons occupy orbitals of equal energy, one electron enters each orbital until all the orbitals contain one electron with the same spin direction. Hund's rule states that electrons occupy orbitals of the same energy in a way that makes the number of electrons with the same spin direction as large as possible. For example, three electrons would occupy three orbitals of equal energy as follows. That would, for instance, be the p suborbital. Second electrons then occupy each orbital so that their spins are paired with the first electron in the orbit, and they would be going the other way to indicate the opposite direction, or negative two, negative one half, sorry, negative one half. Thus, each orbital can eventually have two electrons with paired spins. Look at the orbital filling diagrams of the atoms listed in Table 3 in the following slide. An oxygen atom contains eight electrons. The orbital, the orbital of the lowest energy, 1s, has one electron. Then, a second electron of opposite spin. The next orbital to fill is 2s. It also contains one electron, then a second electron of opposite spin. One electron then occupies each of the three 2p orbitals of equal energy. The remaining electron now pairs with an electron occupying one of the 2p orbitals. The other 2p orbitals remain only half filled with one electron each. And here's the diagram, okay, the orbital filling. A convenient shorthand method for showing the electron configuration of an atom involves writing the energy level and the symbol for every sublevel occupied by an electron. You indicate the number of electrons occupying the sublevel with a superscript for hydrogen with one electron 
in a 1s orbital, the electron configuration is written 1s1. For helium, with two electrons in a 1s orbital, the configuration is 1s2. For oxygen, with two electrons in a 1s orbital, two electrons in a 2s orbital, and four electrons in 2p orbitals, it is written 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. Note that the sum of the superscripts equals the num of number of electrons in the atom and also the number of protons because it's ground state. When the configurations are written, the sublevels within the same principal energy level are generally written together. This is not always the same order as given on the off-bow diagram. The 3D sublevel, for example, is written before the 4S sublevel, even though the off-bow diagram shows the 4S sublevel to have lower energy. Copper shown in figure 8 in the following slide has an electron configuration that is an exception to the off-bow principle. You can obtain correct electron configurations for elements up to vanadium, atomic number 23, by following the off-bow diagram for orbital filling. If you were to continue in that fashion, however, here's the periodic table, and you can see where copper is going to be. Copper is going to be 3D9 for instance. If you're going to continue in that fashion, however, you would assign chromium and copper the following configurations. You'd say 4s2, 3d4 for chromium, and copper, you would say 4s2, 3d9. And you can see how that's true. You see chromium on the left, you see scandium, titanium, vanadium, chromium. So chromium would be 4s2, and then 3d4, and then copper would be 4s2, 3d9. So that would be what you would consider uh, correct for that. So, um, so that those are the electron configurations that are predictable according to the off-bow principle. However, there are, I don't want to call them exceptions, but exceptional uh, exceptional cases that are consistent though with with um, let's call it energy in the atom and the conservation of energy in the atom and the lowest energy possible for the atom because everything seeks to be stable and everything wants to be of lowest energy here is a quick picture of copper Copper is uh, second best only to silver. Uh, copper is a good conductor of electricity and is commonly used in electrical wiring. And there are some pictures of copper. Okay, this is a day later actually. I, I uh, made some changes as you'll see in the next bunch of slides after this one. Uh, copper shown in figure 8. Actually, I already showed you copper in the previous slide. Uh, that is... Uh, 3d9. You see how the 4s's are filled, 4s2 and then 3d9. And and remember the off-bow principle says the lower energy electrons are filled first. So when you put them in and you're writing them, which one, you know, they're in the order of lowest energy electrons to highest energy electrons. So you can obtain the correct electron configuration for elements up to scandium atomic number 23, by following the off-bow diagram for orbital filling. And we, we looked at the periodic table for that as well. Uh, that also gives us the off-bow filling. If you were to continue in that fashion, however, you would assign chromium and copper the following incorrect configurations. And this is what you would get, 4s2, and then 3d4 for chromium, and then 4s2 to 3d9 for copper. And that's the way we'll, we'll end up doing it, unless otherwise noted. However, <clears throat> you, you have to start thinking like a chemist. And you've got to understand that there are cases where 
the electrons will shift because an, e an easy shift will give a configuration that is lower energy. The sum of the changes involved equal a lower energy state. So the 3D electrons will be a lower energy level than the 4S electrons. And we're going to look first at the orbital filling of the three D's and then we'll talk a little bit more about what's happening and why with this change in electro uh, in the electron configuration why is a different electron configuration more stable what does it look like visually okay hold on and we'll we'll, we'll be we will begin hold on Okay, this is the filling for scandium. It has one electron in the 3D. Now remember, the 4S electrons are already distributed. We're not showing the 4S electrons. We're showing the, just the 3D electrons. So I want to make sure you know, relative to the Aufbau principle, how the electrons are filled, and also, more importantly, according to the periodic table. Before we make these changes, I want to go through the filling of 3D. Now this will happen very quickly. I'm just going to leave it go and then we'll come back and we will look at the last slide and the configuration of the 3D orbitals relative to uh, electron filling. Alright, let's look at it. Okay, titanium, now vanadium, chromium has four, manganese has five, very stable and then iron, easy, cobalt, nickel, see they're almost filling, see as they go across the row when we get to zinc it'll be filled because that's 10 electrons, 5 spheres, 2 electrons each and that will fill it. Alright, that's it. So what you have here is the 3D filling for electrons relative to our understanding of the Aufbau principle. However, there are hidden deep inside these configurations when you also look at the S sublevel, a configuration that is more stable. And when I say more stable, I mean in terms of energy. Not there's another there's another way to create stability. And I'm going to tell you what it is very quickly. But just because I'm always going on about energy and then saying, well, there's one more thing other than energy. The other, we'll call it driving force, really, is entropy. When something tends to be disordered, that's a driving force. For instance, at home, your house gets messy. You don't really do much to it. It just happens very quickly. Uh, if I take a big stack of paper, nice and neat, and I drop it on the floor it's going to become very messy. And the amount of energy I need to make it unmessy is, is, can be tremendous. And so when wood, wood, nice organized wood, when it burns, it burns into gases and makes very stable molecules like carbon dioxide. And uh, they're more stable, but they're more disordered going from a solid to a gas, very disordered. But we're not going to talk much about it right now. But entropy is the other driving force. But when I talk about these arrangements, I talk about these arrangements in terms of energy. They're energetically more efficient, more stable, and they are sought after in terms of electron configuration and the off-bow principle. Now I'm going to look specifically at the filling of chromium then copper and see if we can get a see if we can get a um, more of a visual picture on why one configuration might be more plausible than another one so let's look at the filling of chromium and then the filling of copper now the first thing you're going to notice is there are there is one s orbital 
and there are five d orbitals. So let's begin, we'll go through it quickly, and then see what we can see. Okay, here we go. So what happens is the the you have the you have this configuration and then energetically you're going to transfer one of the s electrons to one of the d orbitals that's empty and then let's see what we get as a result of that so now what we'll do is we'll transfer one of the 4s electrons to 3d now what's going to happen is you'll end up with a half s half filled s and a half filled d now a half filled d even even looks intuitively looks more stable and, and it is it's it's very stable and uh, matter of fact it's more stable than the half filled s more stable so when everything clears when the dust settles you'll end up with the 3d half filled 3d more stable so you'll say uh, you'll say that that comes first in the off-bow presentation of the electron, the electron configuration. So that is why you have that exception. And you can clearly see that it's really not an exception. There, is, there are specific reasons why it occurs. Now here's, we're going to do the same exact thing with copper. There's one S and, and five Ds and it's going to be the same exact exercise but you're going to end up with something that looks slightly different yet extremely extremely stable and that is going to be the the as you can see here the complete filled 3D so I'm going to transfer the 4s, one of the 4s electrons to one of the half filled d orbitals and I'll end up with a full d and a half filled s. Well that full d is more stable matter of fact the difference in stability is probably greater here than it would be if it was half filled and it says, I say here that in this arrangement, in the new arrangement, the full D subshell is more stable than the new S1. The total energy is lower in this new arrangement. So, again, things are going to seek to be energetically more stable. And this is why. So, in conclusion, we say that the correct configuration for chromium at the end is 4S1, 3D5, and 4S1, 3D10 for, for copper. And that's because of the off-bow rule. The off-bow rule says, the off-bow principle says that when you fill the electrons, you're filling the lowest energy electrons first. So it says these arrangements give chromium a half-filled D sublevel and copper a filled D sublevel. Filled energy sublevels or half-filled levels are more stable than partially filled sublevels. Some actual electron configurations differ from those assigned using the off-bow principle because half-filled sublevels are not as stable as filled sublevels, but they are more stable than other configurations. In other words, a half-filled D as opposed to 4 in the D is going to be more stable. And we'll see that played out more significantly when we talk about ionization energies in Chapter six right in the next chapter we'll see that played out a little bit it says it says this tendency overcomes the small difference between the energies of the 3d and 4s sublevels in copper and chromium exceptions to the off-bow principle are due to subtle electron electron interactions in orbitals with very similar energies at higher principal quantum numbers energy differences between some sublevels such as 4f and 6d for example are even smaller than in the chromium and copper examples. As a result, as a result, there are more exceptions to the off-bow principle. And we'll also see that there's much more, there are many more subtle variations in energy based on the ionization energies. When we look at the ionization energy of the D 
sublevels and the F sublevels, we will see that those variations in ionization energy are very, 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 very small. So what they said in that slide is comes to life uh, when we talk about ionization energies. Although it is worth knowing that exceptions to the Aufbau principle occur, it is more important to understand the general rules for determining electron configurations in the many cases where the Aufbau rule applies. If you walk in the evening along a busy street lined with shops and theaters, you are likely to see neon advertising signs. The signs are formed from glass tubes bent in various shapes. An electric current passing through the gas in each glass tube makes the gas glow with its own characteristic color. In this section, you will learn why each gas glows with a specific color of light. The previous sections in this chapter introduced you to some ideas about how electrons in atoms are arranged in orbitals, each with a particular energy level. You also learned how to write electron configurations for atoms. In the remainder of this chapter, you will get a closer look into what led to the development of Schrodinger's equation and the quantum mechanical model of the atom. Rather curiously, the quantum mechanical model grew out of the study of light. Isaac Newton, 1642 to 1727, tried to explain what was known about the behavior of light by passing the light, by, by assuming that light consists of particles. By the year 1900, however, there was enough experimental evidence to convince scientists that light consists of waves. Figure 9 in the following slide illustrates some of the properties of waves. As shown, each complete wave cycle starts at zero, increases to its highest value, passes through zero to reach the lowest value, and returns to zero again. The amplitude of the wave is the wave's height from zero, not from the trough, from zero to the crest, as shown in figure nine. The wavelength consists of lambda, the Greek letter lambda. It is the distance between the crest. That's the wavelength. So you have the wavelength and you have the amplitude. Okay, those are the mechanical... Uh, parts of the wave. You also have the trough, etc. The frequency and wavelength of light waves are inversely related. As the wavelength increases, the frequency decreases, and vice versa. And you can see how the one with, the one with shorter wavelength is also going to have more energy if you think of it as a rope. The frequency represented by nu is the number of wave cycles to pass a given point per unit of time. The unit of frequencies, the unit of frequency are usually cycles per second. The SI unit of cycles per second is called hertz. A hertz can also be represented by the reciprocal second. By the reciprocal second. So you could use either one, either hertz, which is actually SI, or per second. Cycles is understood. So the product of the frequency and wavelength always equals a constant C, the speed of light. It's not V, it's C is the speed of light. The wavelength and frequency of light are inversely proportional to each other. As the wavelength of light increases, for example, the frequency decreases. According to the wave model, light consists of electromagnetic waves. Electromagnetic radiation includes radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible, ultraviolet waves, X-rays, and gamma rays. All electromagnetic radiation travels in a vacuum at the speed of essentially 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Sunlight consists of light with a continuous range of wavelengths and frequencies. There's 
couple holes here and there, but it's basically all the frequencies of visible light, at least. It also has ultraviolet, and that's what's so bad for you, for your skin. Now, as you can see from figure 10 in the following slide, the color of light for each frequency found in sunlight depends on its frequency. When sunlight passes through a prism, the different frequencies separate into a spectrum of colors. A rainbow is an example of this phenomenon. Each tiny droplet, each tiny droplet of water acts as a prism to produce a spectrum. Each color blends into the next in order in order of red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, Roy G. Biv. They don't have indigo there, but indigo is kind of like navy blue. It is navy blue. In the visible spectrum, as shown in figure 10, red light has the longest wavelength and the lowest frequency. Here is an example, figure 10. The electromagnetic radiation spectrum consists of radiation over a broad band of wavelengths. The visible light portion is very small. I will let you read the rest of that caption, but then I will ask you what types of non-visible, non-visible radiation have wavelengths close to those of red light to those of blue light, red light and blue light, but invisible. Here is an example of a spectrum, electromagnetic radiation spectrum, uh, <clears throat> and it's a missing some lines. Those missing lines are absorbed. Those are absorption spectrum. And you can tell what element or elements is giving off that light by detailing not what's there, but what's missing. Sometimes that's, <coughs> excuse me, sometimes that's the easiest. It's called absorption spectrum. So you can use absorption spectrum to identify a particle like a fingerprint and you can measure it, put it on a computer, it'll spit out what is the frequency of that missing line, of that missing line, of that missing line. You have emission spectra as well, and we'll see that a little bit later, the most famous of which is hydrogen. because it's This is figure 11, sodium vapor lamps produce a yellow glow. It would also have, if you looked at it in a fine way with emission spectroscopy, you would see specific, a specific fingerprint of energies and frequencies uh, that is given off by this particular element. Passing an electric current through a gas in a neon tube energizes the electrons of the atom of the gas and causes them to emit light. When atoms absorb energy, electrons move into higher energy levels these electrons then lose energy by emitting light when they return to lower energy levels in figure 12a in the following slide. Shows how ordinary light is made up of a mixture of all the wavelengths of light. However, the light emitted by atoms consists of a mixture of only specific frequencies. Each specific frequency of visible light emitted corresponds to a particular color. So what we're going to look at now is if I have light, say a light bulb, an incandescent light bulb. Remember what incandescence is. Incandescence is going from infrared to visible light. So it goes through this slit, then it goes through the prism, then it goes through the screen, and you can see the colors of the spectrum. In this case, it's, it's small frequencies to, high, to uh, high frequencies to low frequencies, or short wavelengths to long wavelengths. That's how it's organized. Uh, therefore, when the light passes through the prism shown in 12b in the following slide, the frequencies of light emitted by an element separate into discrete lines to give the atomic emission spectra of the element. Each discrete line in an emission spectrum corresponds to one exact frequency 
of light emitted by the atom. 12b shows the visible portion of the emission spectrum of helium. The emission spectrum of each element is like a person's fingerprint. Just as no two people have the same fingerprints, no two elements have the same emission spectrum. So here is a helium lamp and the light goes through the slit. The slit uh, produces a certain polarized light uh, and then it goes through the prism, it's broken down into colors and that's the spectrum that you can see the spectrum against the screen where you just have certain lines and those lines are indicative of helium so that makes things very easy to see. Okay, here you have helium. So you put the helium lamp in and it goes to polarize the, polarize the light through the slit and then it goes into the prism and then the prism produces uh, lines that are obvious. Let's take a look quickly and to see what the lines are specifically. So in the back you can see even the way it's separated is that there's a red, an orange, a yellow, greenish blue, or green, sorry, and then there's like a cyan, and then a blue, and then a violet. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines, and those lines are a fingerprint of helium. No two elements are going to have exactly the same fingerprint. They call it a, a spectrum. And this is, the study of this is called spectroscopy. This is uh, hydrogen, and that's what I'm talking about. This is actually deuterium, or hydrogen, same thing. Uh, deuterium is just an isotope. And you have, those are the frequencies down below. And uh, you can see that the hydrogen is made of four spectral lines. And those are, reading from left to right, they're going to be red, cyan, and two purples. And you can look at those frequencies, and those will be specific for hydrogen. Here's helium. And again, we looked at helium before. This is a little bit more of an exact uh, <coughs> spectrum of helium. And you can see that if you, if you put these frequencies in the computer, it would match with if you had uh, some helium used in a crime, you could match it at, you know, some NCIS crime scene investigative unit. could figure it out. This is mercury. So those are the frequencies for mercury. And then this is uranium. So I can determine where uranium might be uh, because I have a light spectrum. If I want to heat it, say I heat a rock and see if uranium is in there, I could, I could figure out what the rock is by looking at the spectrum. Uh, so I have, and you can, you can organize these from left to right or right to left. The, those were left to right, red to violet, uh, or you could say violet to red. You could say uh, high frequency to low frequency or low frequency to high frequency. This is high frequency to low frequency. These are this is another shot of uh, hydrogen, helium, and neon. There's a continuous spectrum, an emission spectrum, and then you have, a, below, you have what they call an absorption spectrum. An absorption spectrum. So you have various kinds of spectroscopy. Here's another, uh, another look at the hydrogen absorption spectrum and the hydrogen emission spectrum. You choose what might be better. Uh, to look at. Looks like to me I would rather see the emission spectrum. So here's the production of the lines where you have uh, <coughs> you go from energy E2 to E1. First of all you have to get it up there. You have to excite it from E1 to E2 and then it, then it goes back down. So you have the light source you have uh, and it, it, you go through the gas cloud if, and then you're going to excite those particles in the gas cloud and you're going to see what's in there. All right? So I have, I have a particular element in there and I can determine what that element is based on the light, the analysis of the light. 
So if I analyze the light after it passes through a sample, I can tell scientifically what's, what's in that sample. It says, in the same way that fingerprints identify people, atomic emission spectra are useful for identifying elements. Figure 13 in the following slide shows the characteristic colors um, uh, emitted by mercury and by nitrogen. Much of the knowledge about the composition of the universe comes from studying the atomic spectra of the stars, which are hot, glowing bodies of gases. Here I have figure 13. Uh, no two elements have the same emission spectra. A mercury vapor lamp produces a blue glow. Nitrogen gas gives off a yellowish-orange, kind of like a peach glow. So if I analyze more carefully two colors that may look similar, they would indeed be different if I looked at their individual emission or absorption spectra. Atomic line spectra were known before Bohr proposed his model of the hydrogen atom. However, Bohr's model not only explained why the emission spectrum of hydrogen consists of specific frequencies of light, it also predicted specific values of these frequencies that agreed with experiments. In the Bohr model, the lone electron in the hydrogen atom can have only certain specific energies. When the electron has its lowest possible energy, the atom is in its ground state. In the ground state, the principal quant quantum number n is 1. Excitation of the electron by absorbing energy raises the atom from the ground state to an excited state with n equals 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. Remember, ground state is n equals 1, and so forth. A quantum of energy in the form of light is emitted when the electron drops back to the lower energy level. The emission occurs in a single abrupt step called an electronic transition. Bohr already knew from earlier work that this quantum of energy E is related to the frequency V or nu of the emitted light by the equation E equals H nu where H is equal to 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds, or that could be 6.63, what you'll see oftentimes in literature, times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds. Now, the light emitted by an electron moving from a higher to a lower energy level has a frequency directly proportional to the energy change of the electron. Therefore, each transition produces a line of a specific frequency in the spectrum. Figure 14 in the following slide, actually it's two slides away, shows the explanation for the three groups of lines observed in the emission spectrum of hydrogen atoms. The lines at the ultraviolet end of the hydrogen spectrum are the Lyman series, are the Lyman series. Figure 5.14 the three groups of lines in the hydrogen spectra correspond to the transition of electrons from higher energy levels to lower energy levels. The Lyman series corresponds to the transitions to the n equals 1 energy level, the ground state. The Balmer series corresponds to transitions to the n equals 2 energy level, and the Passion series corresponds to the transition to the n equals 3 energy level. So you have the Lyman the Balmer and the Passion series, which corresponds to, which correspond to specific transitions. And here is a visual of the Lyman, the ultraviolet series, of the, the Balmer, or the visible series, and then you have the Passion, which is the infrared series, and the Lyman series is going to n equals 1, the Balmer series goes to series goes to n equals two, and the Passion series goes series goes to n equals three. 
and the Bomber series being the middle. An explanation of atomic spectra continued here. These match expected values for the emission due to the transition of electrons from higher energy levels to lowest energy level, n equals 1, transitions to n equals 3 from higher energy levels produce the passion series. The energy changes of the electron and therefore the frequencies of emitted light are generally smaller still. The lines are in the infrared range. Spectral lines for the transitions from higher energy levels to n equals 4 and n equals 5 also exist. Note that the spectral lines in each group become more closely spaced at increased values of n because the energy levels become closer together. There is an upper limit to the frequency of emitted light for each set of lines. The upper limit exists because an electron with enough energy completely escapes the atom. That would be the ionization energy. Bohr's theory of the atom was only partially satisfactory. It explained the emission spectrum of hydrogen, but not the emission spectra of atoms with more than one electron. Moreover, it was of no help in understanding how atoms bond to form molecules. Eventually, a new and better model, the quantum mechanical model, displaced the Bohr model of the atom. The quantum mechanical model is based on the description of the motion of material objects as waves. Motion of material objects as, as waves. In 1905, Albert Einstein, then a patent examiner in Bern, Switzerland, returned to Newton's idea of particles of light. Einstein successfully explained experimental data by proposing that light could be described as quanta of energy. The quanta behave as if they were particles. Like quanta, also called photons, although the wave nature of light was well known, the dual wave particle behavior of light was difficult for scientists trained in classical physics to accept. <clears throat> also, Einstein won the Nobel Prize because that was actually later called the photoelectric effect. If you've ever heard of solar, solar heating, uh, solar power, uh, that's the underlying cause of, how, of why that works. In 1924, Louis de Broglie, a French graduate student, asked an important question. Given that light behaves as waves and particles, can particles of matter behave as waves? De Broglie referred to the wave-like behavior of particles as matter waves. His reasoning led him to a mathematical expression for the wavelength of a moving particle. The proposal that matter moves in a wave-like way would not have been accepted unless experiments confirmed its validity. Only three years later, experiments by Clinton Davison and Lester Germer at Bell Labs in New Jersey, I've been there many times, lived down the road from there, did just that in Bell Labs in New Jersey. The two scientists had been studying the bombardment of metals with beams of electrons. They noticed that the electrons reflected from the metal surface produced curious patterns. The patterns were like those obtained when X-rays, which are electromagnetic waves, reflect from metal surfaces. The electrons believed to be particles were reflected as if they were waves. De Broglie was awarded the Nobel Prize for his work on the wave nature of matter. Davison also received the Nobel Prize for, experiment, for his experiments demonstrating the wave nature of electrons. Today, the wavelength properties of beams of electrons are useful in magnifying objects.
the electrons in, a, in an electron microscope have much smaller wavelengths than visible light. This allows a much clearer enlarged image of a very small object such as the mite in figure 15 on the next slide. It looks like it's something out of a horror movie. Then is possible with an ordinary microscope. De Broglie's equation predicts that all moving objects have wave-like behavior. Why are you unable to observe the effects of this wave-like motion for ordinary objects like baseballs and trains? Let me read that again. Why are you unable to observe the effects of this wave-like motion for ordinary objects like baseballs and trains? Here is the here is a mite. An electron microscope can produce sharp images of a very small object such as this mite because of the small wavelength of a moving electron compared with that light. So that might help you answer the question that was posed to you in the last slide because of the small wavelength of the moving electron. The answer is that the mass of the object must be very small in order for its wavelength to be large enough to observe. For example, a 50 gram, go a 50 gram golf ball traveling at 40 meters per second, about 90 miles per hour, has a wavelength of only 3 times 10 to the negative 34th meter, which is much too small to detect experimentally. On the other hand, an electron has a mass of only 9.11 times 10 to the negative 28 grams. If it were moving at a velocity of 40 meters per second, it would have a wavelength of 2 times 10 to the negative 5 meters, which is comparable to infrared radiation and is readily measured. The newer theory is called quantum mechanics. The older theory is called classical mechanics. Classical mechanics adequately describes the motions of bodies much larger than atoms, while quantum mechanics describes the motions of subatomic particles and atoms as waves. German physicist Werner Heisenberg examined another feature of quantum mechanics that is absent in classical mechanics. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle states that it is impossible to know exactly both the velocity and the position of a particle at the same time. This limitation is critical in dealing with small particles such as electrons. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle states that it is impossible to know exactly both the velocity and the position of a particle at the same time. Very important. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle does not matter, however, for ordinary sized objects such as cars or airplanes. To understand this principle, consider how, to, how you determine the location of an object. To locate a set of keys in a dark room, for example, you can use a flashlight. You see the keys, when the light bounces off them and strikes your eyes. Likewise, to locate an electron, you might strike it with a photon of light, as shown in figure 16 in the following slide. It says in figure 16, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle states that it is impossible to know exactly both the velocity and the position of a particle at the same time. Let me read that again. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle states that it is impossible to know exactly both the velocity and the position of a particle at the same time. Uh, after collision, the impact changes the electron's velocity, making it uncertain. If the photon is coming in and the moving electron, before the collision, the photon strikes an electron during an attempt to observe the electron's position. So it's a little bit dicey. It, in, in contrast to the keys, the electron has such a small mass that striking it with a photon affects its motion 
in a way that cannot be predicted uh, precisely. So the very act of measuring the position of a, an electron changes its velocity and makes it makes it its velocity uncertain. The discovery of matter waves paved the way for Schrodinger's quantum mechanical description of electrons in atoms. Schrodinger's theory leads to the concept of electron orbitals and configurations, and it includes the wave-like motion of matter and the uncertainty principle. If a tree falls in the woods, does it make a sound? Haha. Uh -huh. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. That's probably where the question came from. And the answer would be, of course it makes a sound, because the Heisenberg uncertainty principle works for different types of objects, not giant trees. It works for very small objects, very, very, very small objects, not large objects. You use classical mechanics to describe the behavior of large objects. Spectroscopist something I did after college and during college when I studied chemistry. If you like the idea of finding the chemical content of unknown materials in chemical research, police investigations, and studies of distant stars, you might consider a career as a spectroscopist. Spectroscopy is the recording and analysis of the wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation emitted by samples of materials. Optical emission spectroscopy uses emission lines from atomic transitions in a heated sample of material. Spectroscopists observe emission lines from the sample by using an electronic detector and recording its output. The recorded data gives the wavelength and the intensity of each emission line. The recorded data gives the wavelength and intensity of each emission line. Here is a picture on the left of a uh, modern use of spectroscopy and the instrument that's used and on the right is a more classic demonstration of observing light and the spectral lines. The characteristic pattern of wavelengths and intensities is the emission spectra of the sample. Spectroscopists use spectro spectrometers, uh, densitometers, and other measuring instruments to collect data. They analyze the densitometer or spectrometer readings to find the ratio of various elements in the sample. They calculate the relative concentrations of substances in the sample by comparing with data for known concentrations. They also use their mathematical skills in statistics to calculate a numerical value indicating the reliability of each analysis. Spectroscopists usually have an advanced degree in chemistry, along with skills in mathematics and in using scientific equipment. Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr had different views of quantum mechanics. Although Einstein accepted quantum mechanical theory as the best explanation available at the time, he was convinced the theory was incomplete. He believed in the existence of hidden variables, which, if known, would eliminate problems such as wave-particle duality and uncertainty. Bohr, on the other hand, urged physicists to accept quantum mechanics without qualification. Max Planck showed that energy could be absorbed or emitted by a body only in quanta, whose energy is given by the equation E equals H nu, where H is a proportionality constant called Planck's constant. Planck's proposal was revolutionary. Everyday experience had led people to believe that no limitation existed for the smallness or permissible energy changes in a system. For example, appearances would lead you to believe that thermal energy may be continuously supplied to heat liquid water to any temperature between zero and 100 degrees. Actually, the water temperature increases by infinitesimally small steps that occur as individual molecules absorb 
quanta, which is plural of quantum, of energy. The discovery of helium. Sometimes discoveries in one area of science, such as chemistry, become important in solving problems in another, such as astronomy. In 1868, Pierre Janssen and Joseph Norman Lockyer discovered an emission spectrum for gases on the surface of the sun that did not match any known element on Earth. In 1895, William Ramsey discovered the existence of helium on Earth. The emission spectrum of helium was found to be identical to that of the unknown gas observed by Janssen and Lockyer almost 30 years earlier. Thus, by combining two discoveries from two different fields of science, 30 years apart, a new discovery was made. Earth and the stars have some elements in common. Now, you have to be able to understand the nature of light, for instance, before you can understand astronomy. Because the data that we have from astronomy is entirely light-based. Everything we see from the stars is light. Yes, light's very important to observe anything, even on Earth, because we need light to see. But the data that we accumulate is light data, for instance, from distant stars. Here's a picture of the sun and its different parts. Light as a particle. In 1666, Sir Isaac Newton carried out important experiments with light that led to the proposal that light consists of tiny particles called corpuscles. Twelve years later, a Dutch scientist, Christian Wiegens, suggested a light, a wave theory to explain the properties of light. For more than 200 years, scientists argued about these seemingly contradictory theories. By the year 1900, most scientists had finally accepted that light could be described as a wave. Paradoxically, they soon had to accept that light could, at the same time, be described as a particle. So light is not as easy as it sounds. It actually can be very, very complex. The wave-particle duality of light makes it not what it appears to be. Schrodinger's equation accounted mathematically for de Broglie's discovery of the wave-light properties of the electron. These developments led to a major break away from the Bohr model of the atom. Schrodinger extended de Broglie's work by considering the movement of a particle in an electromagnetic field which established an area of physics known as, wait for it, wave mechanics. So let's summarize a few things that we've discussed. Classical versus quantum mechanics. Rutherford's model of the atom. Electrons orbiting around a dense, massive, positive nucleus. Expected to be able to use classical Newtonian mechanics to describe the motion of the electrons around the nucleus. However, classical mechanics failed to explain experimental observations. Resulted in the development of quantum mechanics. Treats electrons as both a particle and a wave. It's called the wave-particle duality of nature. Parts of a wave. You have a crest, high point, of the wave, a trough, low point, on the wave, amplitude, distance from the origin, or the nodal area, the x-axis, so to speak, to the crest, wavelength, distance from the crest to the crest, or really any cycle, any, any point on, on the wave to another point on the adjacent wave. To calculate, use lambda is C over V, where V is actually nu, that's the speed of light, I'm sorry, the frequency of light, and remember that 
The velocity of light is actually C, and it's 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Use the indirect relationship. Lambda nu equals C. The other equation is E energy equals H Planck's constant times nu, or the frequency. And that is all she wrote. Have a great day. Enjoy your time off, and goodbye.